Hi, and welcome to Author Uncut. I'm your host and author, Patrice Williams Marks. Today, I'll be reading from Chapter 8 of my revenge thriller, Counterpunch. But first, if you enjoy my podcast, I'd be grateful if you spread the word by leaving a rating and a review. Author Uncut can be found wherever you enjoy listening to your podcast. Here's a synopsis of Counterpunch. Everest was not the perfect mom, but what she was was fierce. After her husband Anthony died at the hands of a drunk driver, it was up to her to raise their daughter Mo alone. Her love for Mo was both unmistakable and unshakable. But when Mo failed to return home from swim practice with not so much as a text, Everest knew something was wrong. Will Everest find Mo in time to save her life? Better still, what will she do to the scumbag that brutalized her daughter? Make him pay. Chapter 8 The Shift Everest had always asserted that there was no place in this world for grudges. She saw them as a waste of energy that rattled the soul. Grudges, she once thought, only harmed the person carrying them. But after the anguish she had been suffering over the violation of her daughter, her world had shifted, and that included her opinion on revenge. Godfrey had asked both of them to come down to the station for an update, if you could call it that. They were to meet with Detective Marlena Sanchez of the Sex Crimes Division. Detective Sanchez had just been promoted and could count on one hand the number of cases she had assigned to her. She was a woman who never broke eye contact first and took pride in her appearance. Everest and Mo were ushered into her office by Goodroy. Everest shook Sanchez's hand while Mo ignored her, choosing instead to study the office. She paid particular attention to the whiteboard, which had a list of cases by victims' names, numbering 1 through 23, with only four of the names crossed out. Mo was not listed within the 23, but had been written in as a side note. Mo stared at the dingy beige walls, which were purposely uninviting. Sanchez had an organized desk with multiple stacks of files, but no personal effects. Everest automatically didn't trust a woman like Sanchez with no sign of human compassion to greet her visitors. Sanchez spoke directly to Mo first, then Everest, when she introduced herself and extended her hand out to shake. Mo looked at her hand, then turned back around. Sanchez was unfazed and shifted her focus to Everest instead. Everest did shake her hand with a firm, unwavering grip, clasping her left hand over her joined hands. Sanchez was surprised at her self-assuredness, which matched her level. Ray had taught Everest at age four to properly shake someone's hand. He said that she should always look them square in the eyes, then extend her right hand towards them in an open, friendly gesture. Ray said that if someone didn't look her in the eye, then they could not be trusted. Once a shake was in motion, Everest was to take her left hand and cover the joined hands in a two-handed shake. Ray would prop her up on his knee whenever he had a lesson to instill. He showed her what a firm, solid handshake felt like and how it conveyed that she was a professional and confident. At four, she had no idea what professional and confident meant, but she knew it was good. She was also told to always remove her Sunday church gloves as well before shaking someone's hands, as not doing so appeared rude. The final lesson was the number of pumps needed. One pump was okay if it was a quick greeting. However, three pumps were ideal. Everest carried those lessons with her from that day onward. As you know, we believe the assailant's actions to be serial in nature. We also believe that he lives in the vicinity of the attack. 
Sanchez delivered the information matter-of-factly as if she were logging in evidence. This did not sit well with Everest. She knew that cops needed to be detached from a situation in order to be of optimum service, but to her, this was just too cold. Sanchez continued, explaining that the assailant's pattern had repeated over and over again, along with the computer searches she had done looking for a match. Everest stopped her mid-spiel and asked the obvious question that she had been dancing around, which was, Do they have any suspects, or are they close to locking one down? Sanchez sidestepped the question the way a politician would, and instead focused on their next steps. When asked exactly what those next steps were, Sanchez said that since no fingerprints were found at the scene, and that Mo could not give a solid description of the man who attacked her, her only option was to hope for leads to be called in. She assured Everest and Moe that the person who assaulted Moe would make a mistake somewhere along the line, and that would be his undoing. So again, just like the Goodroy conversation, Everest grasped from this conversation that the man would not only have to assault or kill someone else, but tell someone about it before they could catch him. That was lunacy, Everest shouted while she stood up. Her plan was to wait for evidence to come to her, with all the people in that office being paid by her tax dollars. Not a one could come up with a better strategy than that. Mo slid into a chair and slapped her palms over both ears. She hummed while rocking back and forth. Her muscles tensed as her hands curled around her ears. Her stomach churned while she trembled uncontrollably. Mo had just completed swim practice and simply wanted to go home to bed. She didn't want to wait for her friend or chat with teammates. She slung her duffel over her shoulder and walked towards home. Mo could have called Everest to pick her up, but she needed this time alone to think. Besides, it was her dad's job to be there for her when practice was over. She loved pretending to be embarrassed when her dad picked her up after practice. He knew she wasn't, but feigned his agitation. Her father had been gone for several years, yet his loss hit her that day with such a wallop that it felt so very raw again. It resembled a scab that had been ripped off, exposing a fresh wound. Wasn't she supposed to be over his death? Because that was exactly what she heard from some of her teammates. But how can you get over losing your dad? Mo knew twenty or thirty years wouldn't heal the hurt from the loss, and she deeply resented anyone trying to rush her through it. What did they know about death? Only what they've seen while playing video games. Mo began to resent them for not understanding her loss and for having both parents still alive. As she placed her earbuds inside her eardrums, she heard a familiar honk. She spun around expecting to see her dad driving his F-150 black pickup with alloy wheels and a sunroof. But instead, she saw a friendly-looking older man with silver hair who had pulled over to the shoulder, waving a map in his hand. He was trying to get her attention. His glasses were lopsided, and he looked as if he was in distress. Mo felt sorry for the man who was clearly stuck in the 1980s with his accordion-folded map instead of a smartphone. Mo removed her earbuds and approached the vehicle, making sure to keep a safe distance between herself and the stranger. He explained that he was looking to pick up his granddaughter from practice at Harry's Pizza a few blocks from the school, but had gotten turned around. He asked her where the school was or if she heard of Harry's Pizza. Mo gestured in the direction from which she had come. The man scratched his head and thanked her. He then unfolded the map and studied it. Mo continued on her way home while glancing back at the grandpa who was totally lost. She decided that it wouldn't cost her anything and may even take her mind off her dad if she helped him out. She walked back to his car and offered to plug in the address of Harry's Pizza and to the Google Maps on his phone. The man was more than appreciative. He told her that he only had a flip phone with no internet connection, however. 
While Mo was plugging in the address, he inquired into whether she was on the swim team at school. Mo asked him how he knew, and the man said because her hair was wet and she looked like she was just been swimming. He also commented on her fitness, as he put it. Mo felt a small twinge in her stomach from the last comment he made, but brushed it off as being too suspicious of an old dude. Google Maps located Harry's Pizza, and all she had to do was show the route to the man on her cell. Mo's eyes would gaze up as she held the phone close to the man's face for him to memorize the route. But instead of seeing relief across his face, he cleared his throat and brandished a pistol, which was pointed directly at her. His dominant hand was seated high on the handle with an extended trigger finger that wrapped around the side of the pistol. His grip was white-knuckled tight as he wanted to make a point. Her heart sank and her body froze. Mo felt as if her feet were in cement, keeping her from running. Why can't she run or scream? The man removed his glasses and tossed the map over his shoulder, with his charm erased in an instant. He had unmasked himself. Don't move and you won't get hurt, he promised. With his free hand, the man pulled a zip tie from between his seat. Put your wrist together, he demanded. Mo was wailing her legs and feet to come back to life when he pointed the pistol at her head. She then held her wrist together as he wrapped the zip tie around them and pulled them tight. Was this going to be the end of her life, she thought? What did he plan on doing? The man opened his car door and surveyed their surroundings. There were no passing cars or people on the sidewalk. He used the gun and gestured for her to get in the car. But Mo refused to move. The man grabbed her by her tied wrist and shoved her toward the driver's side of the car. He pushed her with his free hand, but Mo resisted. She kicked and screamed while reaching for the door handle on the passenger side. Unfortunately, the handle had been removed. Mo saw an approaching vehicle and knew that that was her last shot to break free. She twisted her body so that her back was facing the man, pushed her two feet up against the door to use as a leverage, and propelled herself backward in the hopes of knocking him out of the car and kicking out the window at the same time. Mo indeed hit the man so hard with her back that his nose bled. She managed one more yell before everything went black. The man had used the butt of the gun the way someone would use a hammer and struck the back of her skull. Mo was stunned by the sudden blow. She was able to see him close the door, wipe his nose with his sleeve, and start the engine. But the sound of the engine was muffled. She was overwhelmed by pain and unable to process anything else. In her weakened state, the man was able to shove her back down onto the floor of the passenger side as he cleared his throat again and drove away. Mo suddenly didn't recognize where she was. Her humming turned into almost a howl. Sanchez was caught off guard and surged out of her seat with her hand reaching for the phone to summon aid. But Everest grabbed the phone from Sanchez's hand, ripped it out of the wall, and flung it across the room with an almost hulking strength. Sanchez ran for the door and exited the office as Everest wrapped her arms tightly around Mo and whispered in her ear. Once Sanchez returned with several officers, Moe's howls had turned back into hums. With one arm around her shoulder and one around her waist, Everest lifted Moe from the chair and directed her every step out of the office. That's it, baby girl. One step at a time. Sanchez and the officers stepped back and allowed the two to pass. They continued in silence as they watched the mother and daughter leave the precinct. Everest helped Mo into the car, even buckling her seat belt for her before climbing in herself. Her daughter had had a mental breakdown, and the only thing she could do was take Mo back to the therapist who had been seeing her since the assault. Or perhaps something more drastic was needed. Everest had promised her daughter that she would get through this and that she would feel whole again. 
but the therapy was not having any visible effect on her yet, and Mo was becoming more fragile by the day, not less. Holding the grudge or seeking revenge, she had the whole wrong idea most of her life. How ashamed she was of chastising Anthony for the way he felt about Alvin. Who was she to tell him he shouldn't feel the way towards his brother? Perhaps that bunk bed incident was the last straw, the one imprinted into his psyche for the rest of his life. She was wrong to think there was no place for a grudge or revenge. There was. She had no control over what happened to the man who killed her husband on a drunken bender, but she for damn sure had control over the man who split her daughter in two. She just had to find him. That's it. Join me next week for Chapter 9. Counterpunch can be found on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple Books, Google Play, and Kobo. Want to leave me a voice message? Visit my anchor.fm page, the link is in the show notes, and click on the button that says message to leave me one. I may just use your voicemail in a future podcast. Want to suggest a show episode or get in touch? Visit me at authoruncut.com or send an email to mailbag at patricewilliamsmarks.com. And finally, to join our email list, go to authoruncut.com. Until next time, write on.